Can I welcome everyone to the 30th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, before we move on to the, the main items of business, there's one piece uh, of business the committee must decide first, and that is a decision on taking business in private. Um, the first item of business today is to propose that we take items 6 to 10 in private. Uh, these are consideration of the evidence that we're uh, hopefully about to hear on the Transport Scotland Bill, the delegated powers provisions in various bills and our future work programme. Does the committee agree to take these in private? Okay. Um, item two um, is uh, slightly delayed, so we'll move on to item three, uh, consideration of instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the draft assigned colleges, University of the Highlands and Islands Order 2018, the draft budget Scotland Act 2018, Amendment Regulations 2018, and the draft First Tier Tribunal for Scotland Social Security Chamber and Upper Tribunal for Scotland Composition Regulations 2018. Is the committee content with these instruments? And does the committee wish to welcome the Scottish Government's prompt action in withdrawing and relaying the First Tier Tribunal instrument in response to our recommendations on the 2nd of October? Okay. Uh, agenda item four is consideration of instruments subject to negative procedure and no points have been raised on SSIs 2018, 292, 293 and 300. Is the committee content with these? Okay. And uh, agenda item five, uh, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure and no points have been raised on SSI 2018. 298. So is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. Uh, I'll suspend the meeting briefly. Right, welcome back. Um, we'll uh, jump back to agenda item two now, which is consideration of the delegated powers provisions in the Transport Scotland Bill. Uh, and can I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. Um, welcome. Good morning. Morning. Um, he's accompanied by uh, Brendan Rooney, the Bill Team Manager, Kat Quain, Road Works Policy Advisor and Kevin Gibson, a solicitor for the Scottish Government. Uh, so welcome to you all. Um, do you have a, an opening statement, Minister? I do uh, have okay. convener, uh, which may be helpful to the committee in considering these matters. Uh, the Transport Bill is a, a wide piece of legislation and it takes forward a, a suite of measures to improve journeys for the travelling public across Scotland. It also makes some necessary technical improvements to quite specific areas, ensuring more appropriate uh, flex financial flexibility and governance arrangements for some public bodies. Uh, the bill covers bus services, low emission zones, uh, pro uh, prohibits, uh, prohibitions on pavements and double parking, uh, smart ticketing, uh, roadworks and regional transport partnerships and canals. In framing the provisions within the bill, the government has been acutely mindful of striking an appropriate balance between the use of primary legislation and the use of delegated powers. The delegated powers uh, are considered appropriate in a number of places in this bill, 
mostly due to the complex and technical nature of the issues being dealt with. A level of uh, technical detail uh, will be required in regulations, which is simply not appropriate for primary legislation. The bill also deals with issues in relation to which experience of practical operations or advances in technology it will affect how the law should operate. Flexibility is therefore also a key driver for our approach in a number of places. I'd like to highlight that in many areas where regulations are being proposed, extensive stakeholder engagement is already taking place. Uh, this aims to take a collaborative approach to developing uh, the detail and to ensure the secondary legislation is robust and informed by those it will affect. The government does not want to preempt that process or to stifle the chances of interested third parties to help shape the measures. And that's why the proposals uh, before the committee have been framed in the way they have. But even where the government has decided that policy objectives are most appropriately met through the use of delegated powers, we of course want to ensure that Parliament has the necessary detail within the Bill supporting documents as well as evidence from an engagement with the Government to give informed and constructive scrutiny. Transport Scotland officials have given evidence to the Lead Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Uh, they outlined that the Government will endeavour to share it's thinking on secondary legislation with Parliament as the bill progresses. And I want to reiterate that to this committee this morning. I'm aware that the committee wrote to Transport Scotland with specific questions on a number of proposed delegated powers and received a detailed response. And I hope that proved helpful in your consideration. And I'm keen to hear further from members today to see where I can build on that or work with the committee to address any ongoing concerns that it may have. However, the government is clear that the approach to subordinate legislation within the Transport Scotland Bill should be seen in the context of the breadth and complexity of the subject matter at hand. And of course, happy to answer any questions from the committee members. Thank you very much. Um, so. On those delegated powers, the bill has um, over 60 of them. Um, that's uh, that's quite a high number. Uh, we don't often see that, that that number. I think the last time I, I recall uh, was the planning bill, and we had plenty to say on that. Um, can you perhaps tell us why why it's necessary to delegate that that number of powers? I do recognise that it, it does appear to be a high number. Uh, it's a reflection of the uh, significant range of areas that the bill is seeking to address. There are um, in region about seven different areas uh, and uh, around 50, 70 different sections uh, to the bill in itself, uh, which reflects the complexity um, of the bill. Uh, and in a number of these areas, there are clearly very technical elements that still have to be taken forward in order to ensure that the bill, once it's completed its parliamentary course is able to be effectively effectively implemented and the most effective way for us to do that is through these delegated pillars so I think numbers are not reflective in us uh, seeking to just uh, take more delegated pillars it's because of the breadth and the complexity of the bill uh, and the different areas which are contained within it uh, that reflect the need for a greater level of uh, delegated pillars that would normally be the case for a bill Okay Neil Finlay um, the bill makes provision for a, a number of new criminal offences to be created and I'm sure uh, as a former justice minister you'll agree that creating um, offences that criminalise individuals are, is a very a serious uh, and significant step. Um, so why are these not in primary legislation? Um, the principal reason for this is that um, the criminal offences relate to enforcement matters. Uh, so uh, that relates to, for example, in low emission zones. Um, it, it, for the enforcement of low emission zones, it's likely that um, a, a number plate recognition uh, systems would be used for that purpose. There are other technologies which could be used as well. However, the choice uh, of what type of enforcement regime is taken forward by a local authority implementing a low emission zone hasn't been finalised yet. Uh, and until that's been finalised, it's difficult for us to then put in place the exact uh, 
uh, criminal offences that would apply should someone try to circumvent or to compromise that enforcement arrangement. So if it was... Uh, if it was using um, uh, a, a, a registration number recognition uh, uh, cameras, then if they were to try and cover up their number plate, uh, then that would be a clear criminal offence in trying to circumvent the process. Or if you were trying to stop an enforcement officer issuing the ticket for the purpose of, say, for example, parking in a pavement, then that would be a, a criminal offence. But until we have... Uh, uh, finalise the enforcement regime which will be applied in these different areas, we're not in a position where we can actually make the specific criminal offences. The other thing that will come along, which I suspect, having uh, been in justice previously, is that uh, uh, people will adapt their ways about going about doing things if they think they can circumvent the existing enforcement regime. And if you have that set in primary legislation, um, and people are circumventing it or finding a way in which they can get around it, then you have to go back to primary legislation clearly to amend that. By doing it through regulation, it allows us to adapt our approach going forward if we are finding that there are ways in which individuals are trying to get around the regime in order to make sure that they're not able to do so. And in terms of the flexibility, is the flexibility that you want around you know, it being up to authorities about how they enforce, or is it flexibility on what the actual punishment might be? So the enforcement regime, the flexibility is around uh, what would be a criminal offence if you're trying to compromise the enforcement regime. So there's flexibility there for local authorities uh, and uh, the bodies where the provisions are being made for uh, to be able to look at how they want to take forward enforcement. Um, as I say, through use of different technologies and how that adapts and changes. Uh, what we don't have flexibility around is that uh, is or well, there's limited flexibilities around um, the uh, fixed penalty that would be issued. So, for example, we've set out in the uh, in the legislation that the fixed penalty which will be issued is is limited to level five uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, a fine uh, through summary proceedings. Uh, so, there's already limitations on that. Uh, in terms of what could actually be issued. Uh, but this is to deal with those that are trying to compromise that enforcement regime, which would be a criminal offence. And until we've actually finalised what the enforcement regime will be in these different areas, uh, we need to take it forward under regulations. Yeah, so, so the areas you identify are low emission zones, parking uh, prohibition, and um, the reinstatement uh, of roadworks. Could you maybe speak to each of the, these areas? Uh, uh, and advise us on you've, you've, you've kind of elaborated on some of that but why it's not possible for these to be on the face of the bill the enforcement regime well when it, when it comes to uh, low emission zones it, it, it links to the point around uh, the type of mechanism which is going to be used for the enforcement, enforcement purposes so as I mentioned that could be something like um, uh, uh, number plate recognition systems uh, which are uh, used for that purpose so if someone was to compromise that then we need to be able to be in a position where we can have a criminal offence for trying to breach that system uh, but in taking that forward uh, it hasn't been finalised exactly what that enforcement regime will actually be there is also the potential for technology to change as well which gives us other options going forward and taking it forward under regulation allows us to adapt to that change in technology uh, as well. Uh, in relation to uh, uh, pavement and double parking uh, 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 prohibition arrangements, um, it is again, it relates to aspects around enforcement of that and how local authorities uh, will seek to enforce that. Uh, so for some, it will be through um, uh, fixed penalty charges, which they'll, uh, which they'll apply. Um, uh, but again, uh, the work that we're doing with local authorities and how they want to apply that hasn't been finalised. And that's why we want to take it forward on regulation so we can adapt that as well. There is also the potential for new technology in dealing with some of these types of things. So the type of technology which is used by local authorities at the present moment for fixed penalties could be changed at some point in the future. And we need to be able to adapt the regulations to reflect that as well. What would be in the fixed penalty notice, the types of details that would be in it, etc. as well. Uh, and regulations gives us that flexibility. In relation to the uh, roadworks reinstatement uh, uh, quality plans, uh, these are a new uh, provision which has been created. They've never been there before. Um, as it works at the present moment, uh, the commissioner's work is largely undertaken on a uh, a mediated basis where they try to mediate agreement around where work has not been completed to the correct standard and finished to the correct standard to get the contractor to 
carry out uh, further repairs, or for the it could be the it could be the road authority themselves to carry out further repairs. Um, and uh, one of the challenges which there has been is about uh, is to make sure there's adequate compliance with these things. Uh, and there's been a view within the sector for some time is that uh, there's a need to make sure that the commissioner has the ultimate power uh, to be able to actually find uh, a contractor or a roads authority if they're failing to actually comply with um, a, a notice which they've issued. So uh, the offence which has been created within this is part of a new framework that's been created to deliver these new types of um, uh, enforcement provisions around uh, uh, the improvements that will be required through the Commissioner's Office and the uh, uh, and the a backstop measure is that ultimately they will be able to issue a fine or to apply for a fine to be applied to a contractor. The framework and how that will operate is new. Backstops, please. No, no more backstops. I knew when I when I read that, I knew that that was going to probably come up, but <laughs> it's uh, you call, hopefully this one won't be as complex as the other backstop issue, Mr. Finlay. But uh, it's um, it's a it, it's a backstop measure that gives them the power to be able to pursue it if it's necessary. But because the framework has not been fully developed with the sector yet uh, and how it will ultimately ramp up to that, um, our view is it's best to take that in regulation because we can then deal with that at that particular point. So the principle of that then, the, the, the only issue that I have, or the issue I have with that is that um, it's very easy to make the argument that technological change happens quickly and therefore we have to adapt to that um, and that you could apply that to a whole swathes of government policy where technology is going to start to, you know, what will impact on it. Um, it's just a, a, a concern that we move towards everything being done through regulation. Look, I, I, I fully understand that. And it, taking powers through regulation is not something which we've undertaken lightly. Uh, and it is in trying to strike the balance between making sure what can be provided on the face of the bill while at the same time also allow us to have some flexibility to respond to these changes, to help to support local authorities and other partners who are going to be responsible for enforcing them as well and to adapt our approach to that. So you now I understand and recognise the concerns. And if the committee have got views on how we can help to address that, and these are going to be taken forward through affirmative procedures, but if the committee's got views on how we can improve um, uh, how uh, Parliament can have scrutiny of these matters, then I'm more than happy to consider that going forward with the bill. Okay. Is there, um, <clears throat> just picking up on some of your answers there, is there a danger that we, we can end up with a, a, a bit of a postcode lottery uh, in terms of enforcement? Uh, no, because um, what will happen is that the, uh, the me method uh, that local authorities wish to use in terms of uh, enforcement uh, gives them flexibility. Uh, what won't be different is uh, what the penalty would actually be. So, um, so there's there's clear consistency in how that will be applied. Uh, the criminal offences here are to do with the uh, with the uh, supporting enforcement regime. Uh, so, if someone's trying to breach the enforcement regime. Um, there are other forms of technology which could be used. There are means by which local authorities could go about enforcement. What we're trying to do is give the flexibility through regulations to be able to adapt to that uh, and to support that uh, and the choices that they make. Obviously, some councils could, you know, in, in enforce uh, strict, stricter than others. Um, in, in what way do you mean? It, well... Um, if, you, if you're allowing that, that flexibility, and I'm not saying there's anyth anything wrong with that, but um, if you allow that flexibility, uh, then clearly councils will, will take their own view on you know, how, how they enforce you know, either low emission zones or, or pavement parking. Now, what, what, what the criminal offences deal with is, is, is breaches of the enforcement arrangements. So if uh, one local authority uses um, a, a number plate recognition, and another local authority chooses to use another mechanism uh, for that purpose. If the person tries to breach that by covering up the number plate or trying to circumvent the system in some way, then that's a criminal offence uh, they'll be committing. So it, local authorities may take slightly different approaches in how they want to use, uh, uh, how they want to take forward enforcement, but breaches of that uh, will still be a criminal offence, and that's where the regulations gives us that flexibility to adapt to that. Okay. Alison Harris. Good morning. Good morning. 
I know you'll be aware that the Scottish Government's written response to the committee indicated that it's reasonable to assume that the first emission standard specified in the regulations under Section 14A of the Bill will be consistent with the leading European emission standards. It also recognised that European standards for petrol and diesel vehicles have largely been accepted by stakeholders who responded to the consultation. We understand that the Government does accept that the emission standards are fundamental to the scope and operation of the low emission zones, but would parliamentary scrutiny be enhanced if the initial emission standard was set out on the face of the Bill with a power taken in regulations to amend this? Um, uh, uh, that's one option. Um, uh, the principal reason we've set these out in, uh, uh, we want to set these out in regulations because they are likely to change um, uh, and could change quite quickly. Uh, and what we don't want to have to do is to revert to um, uh, primary legislation each time in order to uh, amend and recognise that. Um, the uh, the direction of travel at the present moment is for diesel is the is the Euro six. It's standard and for petrol is the Euro 4 standard um, and uh, that's likely to be the approach which will be taken by um, local authorities in the implementation of low emission zones. However, that hasn't been finalised uh, just as yet uh, and uh, it still has to be finalised by um, all of the uh, parties who will be taking part in the implementation of low emission zones. Uh, so there is a uh, that's a, a part of the reason why we haven't put it onto the face of the bill, but the likelihood is that uh, these standards are going to change and probably change quite rapidly uh, over time. And what we need to do is to be able to adapt and to and to address that um, uh, through regulations. And the regulation making powers gives us the opportunity to do that, but at the same time also providing the opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny. Oh, okay, so you know I appreciate what you're saying, but can you confirm then that the affirmative procedure will apply for any subsequent changes then going forward with emissions under the, the section one forty of the bill? Um, the uh, the the procedure. Well, if there was a, a, a the is it affirmative procedure which we're using for it, it's negative. It's a negative procedure which we've set for that. Um, if the committee had a view that they felt that that would be better dealt with under the affirmative procedure, I'd be more than happy to give consideration to that and whether the, the bill should take account of the uh, moving to an affirmative procedure. You could agree to that now, if you like. Um, I think I'd like to give, uh, uh, give it due consideration um, uh, and to see whether that would be the most appropriate way in which to do it. But um, if, if it helps the committee convene, um, I'm not unsympathetic to the suggestion, uh, but I'd just like to consider all the practical implications of any changes that was to no, affirmative procedure. That. Would it be possible then, Cabinet Secretary, for you actually maybe to write to the committee, going, you know, if the bill is not amended in this way at stage two, and maybe explain your reasons for why you're taking the decisions that well, you're taking? If it'd be helpful, I'd be, I'd be happy to write to you either way, uh, whether we do it okay. or not, yes, uh, and uh, to advise you on that, if that would be, be of assistance. Okay, thank you. And we'll obviously uh, be producing a, a report, and you'll no doubt respond respond to that. Of um, course. Yeah. I mean, it's an uh, an important line of questioning because clearly, um, this you know, in in introducing this uh, affects anyone. You know, well, affects a large could affect a large number of drivers. Um, I think people need to know need to know what's coming. Yeah. Well, even through the negative procedure, there's still a notification process of that. But the, um, as I say, I'm more than happy to, to consider the committee's views on this. OK, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to a, a, another section. That's section 29, which is about bus services. Um, that creates a new power um, allowing ministers to make further provision about what may constitute a facility or measure uh, can you explain to what extent these terms are already defined in the bill and why the power is framed to specify what may constitute a facility or measure? OK, the uh, provisions in the bill are designed to try to be helpful to local transport uh, authorities in uh, setting up uh, bus service improvement partnerships and it allows them to look at how they can use best practice and how we can help to try and take a national approach in addressing these matters. The uh, bus service improvement uh, partnership model uh, it doesn't impose a, a particular obligation 
on local transport authorities in terms of what facilities or measures must uh, be part of the scheme. Instead, what it seeks to do is to try to assist uh, local transport authorities uh, to choose whether to include uh, particular facilities or measures uh, in the circumstances that they're looking to apply a, a, a bus service improvement partnership. Uh, in terms of the, the technical definition, I'll let officials maybe give you a bit of background to their thinking around these terms. Uh, but by and large, um, a, a facility would be something in the form of a infrastructure. So it would be a, a bus stop or bus lane being provided. Uh, measures may be about providing um, additional parking facilities, etc., to assist. It's a slightly broader term, um, uh, but officials can maybe give you a bit of their a bit of background to their thinking around these terms. Uh, but what is important to emphasise here is that what we're not trying to do is be prescriptive to LTAs um, on what measures and facilities should be contained within it. We're trying to be helpful to them and give them an understanding on the issues that they should be considering when they're looking at putting a bus service improvement partnership in place. Brendan. Yeah, I mean, as the Cabinet Secretary was saying, I think the, the, um, the, the terms weren't designed to be particularly prescriptive or particularly restrictive. They were um, the, the improvement partnership will be taken forward at a local level between the local transport authority and, and bus operators in the area. Um, and so there'll obviously be certain nuances that are agreed there depending on any individual partnership. What these regulations do is, is allow for um, for some illustrative examples of, of what, what kind of things that they might be, be talking about or agreeing on in, under the terms facilities or measures. Um, <clears throat> as Mr Matheson was saying, facilities could be sort of um, hard infrastructure like you know bus lanes or bus stops. Um, measures might be traffic management or congestion. Um, taking policies or schemes that help to incentivise buses and um, perhaps de-incentivise public car use um, and that kind of thing. So the, the regulations are envisaged, it's envisaged the regulations will give, will give sort of illustrative examples of these. Um, and again, there's flexibility over time as these partnership arrangements bed in or are taken up across the country to look at how much um, direction is, is, would be needed within regulations to, to, to give the parties involved in these partnerships more of a... Um, more of a framework to um, to come to their agreement on it. Okay. That that's 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 very useful uh, because uh, you know, I think most people wouldn't wouldn't have a clue what a facility or measure was. Um, I, I guess it's uh, it's spelled out somewhere in in the the paperwork accompanying the bill, is it? Yeah, the, I mean, there's policy memoranda and explanatory notes that accompany the bill, giving a, a sort of layman's version of things. Um, right. Obviously, when the regulations come forward, they'll have the, you know, the, the specifics of of, of what uh, underpins those terms. Okay. And and speaking of regulations, um, do you think cabinet secretary uh, be more appropriate for the affirmative procedure uh, to be used for these? Um, I think, given it we're not seeking to be prescriptive, that that would feel to me to be. A step too far. Um, we're not trying to prescribe exactly what uh, LTA should be applying within uh, a bus service and uh, improvement partnership. Uh, it's to try to help to support them in their decision making. And uh, in that sense, it feels to me as though affirmative would potentially be a step too far, that negative procedure would seem to be appropriate and proportionate. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my question concerns Section 29 of the Bill, which makes provisions for uh, ministers to direct local transport authorities in exercising their powers to make or vary um, a ticketing scheme. Now, the Delegated uh, Powers Memorandum states that in issuing these directions, um, a reason will be uh, clearly set out. However, that's a, a political commitment. It's not on the face of the bill. The committee, in correspondence with the government, inquired as to why it would not be set out in the face of the bill that there would be a requirement to provide reasoning. And in the government's reply, it stated that it would be redundant as under administrative law, the Scottish government would be required to give a reason and justification. However, the committee's understanding is that under administrative law, there would be uh, no requirement to provide um, a reason rather than 
unless there was specific context, such as where a public authority departs from its stated provision. Now, in the planning bill, there um, is a requirement on the face of the bill to give specific directions. Um, this is um, in section seven of that planning bill, where directions are given to planning authorities to exercise the power. Um, with all of this in mind, can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary's views are on adding a requirement to the face of the bill to provide um, reasons for the direction to make a ticketing scheme to put the position beyond any doubt? Well, I think the, the members raised a, a very important issue, and it's a, a matter which I've given some consideration to uh, from the correspondence which we've received from uh, the committee. Um, I, I do believe under administrative law uh, there is a requirement for us to be transparent around uh, issuing a direction, uh, but I also think it is an area where we should put it beyond doubt, uh, and this is an area where I do think we should look at amending the bill to reflect that. Um, uh, similar to the way in which we have within the provisions we have within the Planning uh, Act uh, to make sure that there is no dubiety around us issuing direction and then setting out very clearly um, uh, why that direction has been issued. So um, I think the uh, committee's probing of this issue has been helpful in, uh, in formula formulating my thoughts around it. And it feels to me as though we should just put it beyond doubt and make it very clear on the face of the bill that there will be a requirement for ministers to set out the reasoning for that as well. Despite the fact that I do believe under administrative law uh, there is a requirement for us to do that. Um, uh, 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 and to some extent we should just uh, put it on the face of the bill uh, so there are no questions around the matter. Thank you very much for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure that's something my colleagues in the committee will join me in welcoming. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's very useful indeed. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the questions uh, centre around sections 51 to 53 uh, of the Bill. Uh, and these sections confer powers to make regulations about the removal, moving and disposal of uh, motor vehicles parked contrary to parking prohibitions, also such as the section 42 in the pavement parking. Uh, such regulations will engage the right or to property under Article 1 or Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, you said in your written response that you will consider, uh, as the Bill progresses, whether uh, there should be a requirement in the face of the Bill uh, to consult road users before these regulations are actually made. However, given the significance of these powers and that similar UK uh, powers, such as the Road Traffic Regulations Act 1984, uh, contain a consultation requirement, uh, can, uh, can you, Cabinet Secretary, confirm that the, that the bill will be amended to include such a requirement? Well, look, I think it would be fair to say for something like um, uh, regulations in this area, it's an area which we would um, routinely uh, carry out a consultation engagement with a, a range of different stakeholders uh, around how these uh, provisions would be drafted and how they would be uh, taken forward. Um, I'm, um, again, I'm very open to the committee's views on whether they believe that there's a need for something on the face of the bill to require ministers to uh, undertake um, at such a, a consultation uh, because it is a matter for any sort of form of transport type uh, traffic type regulation uh, that we would take forward uh, within government is that we would routinely have a consultation exercise for these matters as a matter of course um, uh, uh, but if the uh, committee feels that uh, they would prefer to see something on the face of the bill, uh, making that very explicit and clear, uh, then I'm happy to give consideration to that. It feels to me as though, um, uh, given it, we would do it as a matter of course, um, having it on the face of the bill um, it puts it beyond any doubt. OK. Um, obviously, well, the committee will uh, we'll, we'll take on board what you've just said there um, and, uh, and also decide uh, in terms of, kind of what we want to do, if that's something that the I uh, want to make uh, further recommendations to you on. Uh, but see, so just on the on the section 42, I know this isn't uh, a delegated powers aspect, but on section 42 in the pavement parking, I chaired the cross-party group on visual impairment. Uh, and as you'll be aware, it's been an issue that's been around for uh, for some years. Uh, Ross Finney, Joe Fitzpatrick, Sandra White, and obviously it's now, uh, now yourself in, in the bill. Uh, and I know that... Uh, in yeah, this time. <laughs> no, indeed. It's, uh, I, I know certainly in discussions, um, it does come up regularly in the cross-party group, and uh, and and it's very much uh, welcomed that uh, the fact it is actually in the bill, and uh, people are looking forward to uh, to that actually uh, come into into force uh, when the bill does pass. 
So I just wanted to make you aware of that uh, from the Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for that comment. And I'm conscious of the uh, a wide range of stakeholders are very keen to see this provision uh, um, enforced and uh, provided within the legislation. Uh, uh, and it's uh, an issue which I know that the uh, uh, Rural Economy Committee have been given very close attention to uh, in their evidence taking uh, so far. So I'm, I'm, I'm keen to get as much parliamentary support as we can for this particular provision within the bill because I think it will make a marked improvement for people who are uh, experiencing difficulties due to uh, pavement parking, particularly people with visual impairments. Mm. Um, thank you for that. And my uh, next question is uh, it's, uh, regarding Section 67 uh, of the Bill, and that confers the powers on, uh, on Scottish Ministers to make a code of practice about reinstatement quality plans uh, to be entered into uh, in the Scottish Roadworks Register. Uh, it also allows regulations uh, to make further provision about these plans, uh, including the consequences uh, of failing to comply with a code of practice and for offences to be created uh, for failure to comply with requirements imposed under the regulations. Uh, you indicated in your written response that the Scottish Government's uh, view was that the Bill did not uh, authorise the regulations to contain uh, provisions making it an offence or imposing any other penalty uh, for failing to comply with the Code of Practice. However, in, in order to put the position beyond uh, any doubt, uh, would you be willing to make this clearer on the face of the Bill? I think that this is quite a complex area, and Kate will probably maybe want to give uh, say a few things in this because it's an area where um, it's completely new, uh, uh, not just here in Scotland, in the UK, uh, and uh, it, part of the reason for doing some of this through regulation making powers is to give us some flexibility to adapt to that as well. Um, it's also a, a new area for the sector uh, and how they will adapt to that and how they will respond to it. Uh, uh, which again is reflective in the way in which we've framed it within uh, the bill as well. I don't know where Kate, do you want to maybe just explain a wee bit more how, uh, why we've taken this particular option? Sure. Um, so the, the yeah, reinstatement of plans are entirely new. Um, they've, uh, we have a, a code of practice for how reinstatement should be carried out for undertakers and we have a resulting inspection regime but we've never previously put anything prior to that, so this is really bringing the focus back on to how things are planned out and, and hopefully trying to improve things that way. Um, could you, sorry, what, what was the, the specific question? No, it's just um, also regarding the, the written response uh, from the government. Um, the, the government's view was that the bill uh, didn't authorise the regulations to contain uh, provision, uh, provisions making an offence or imposing any other penalty for failing to comply with that code of practice. So it was really just that in order to clarify that and put it beyond any doubt, uh, could that be considered on the face of the bill? Kevin, do you have...? Uh, I think the basic point is that a code of practice by its very nature uh, is an advisory document. And so our view is, I think, that unless we were to specifically allow for the regulations to create an offence of failing to comply with that document and, and sort of adjust its nature in that way, um, the the powers the, as they currently stand wouldn't allow us to wouldn't allow us to create the offence. Uh, so I think it's actually by remaining silent on the point that we take the view. I think that uh, that that you can't create that sort of mandatory element to the code of practice. Um, I, I'm sure that we could think about whether there's anything to do to make it a, a bit clearer on the, on the face of the bill, but you know, for the time being, I think, the given that it's, a, you know, as I say, the nature of the, the inherent nature of what a code of practice is, uh, it would need something a bit clearer than a kind of general power to create offences in relation to a general power to uh, make regulations about the code of practice. We need to be a bit clearer and more specific than that, I think, uh, to allow us to create a, an offence in the regulations of failure failure to comply with the code. Okay. okay. Uh, the interest of the committee's views on this, if, there, if they feel there's a way in which we could enhance clarity around this uh, uh, in the face of the bill, and if there is a way in which we can reasonably achieve that, well, then well, they're happy to look at that. Okay. No. Uh, I've got one further question. It's not, it's not a delegated powers uh, question. Can I just ask on sure. um, code, the code of practice thing, why, why did you decide to go down uh, that route rather than something a bit tougher? The way reasonably quality plans work for them to be effective, they really need to be developed through industry. Industry absolutely has to buy in, otherwise it becomes just a, a, a box ticking exercise. And the best way, the most effective way of doing that is through a code of practice that's nationally applied, that applies to everyone that actually has to provide these things. There's also the likelihood is that 
um, uh, the code of practice will have to be changed and adapted as time goes by as well. Uh, and having it uh, in the form of a, a, and because it will be highly technical in terms of as a document, um, a, it is a, a, a code of practice is the most practical way in which to take it forward. Okay. Stuart? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, um, so it's a question just regarding the roadworks um, and uh, also kind of what's in the bill, but. Um, Clearly, uh, if there has, uh, if there is a, an improved dialogue between the the, the, un the undertaker for roadworks and also bus operators, um, then uh, if there was a, if there was better planning, if there was better dialogue, uh, and a longer term planning for for those non-essential and non-emergency roadworks that are required, then um, I don't really kind of see that in the bill, and I know that it has been raised with me. Uh, by bus operators, um, or certainly as a, as a serious concern, and it also kind of ties into comments from Mr. Rooney a short time ago. When Mr. Rooney had said that uh, about incentivising bus usage and de-incentivising car usage. Um, if bus operators, if they have to at the last minute uh, change bus routes, um, and also if, if there is very little dialogue with them, um, then there is no incentive for people to actually go and use buses and to get out of their cars. I think you raise a, an important issue um, around the impact that roadworks can actually have on uh, the quality of bus services being provided. Um, and I know it's an issue that the bus industry are concerned about. Um, significant roadworks just starting without them being notified, uh, and then it can have an impact on their journey times and uh, having to take diversions and passengers not being aware of this as well. Uh, and as a role for the LTAs in these matters, can maybe say a wee bit more about um, some of the work that's been going on to try and address some of these issues, to get greater coordination around these issues. But uh, it's an issue which has been raised with me by the bus uh, bus sector as well. So uh, this is not related to powers, but uh, the well, bus, uh, any stakeholder, actually. We have a really good system in Scotland. We have a national roadwork register that the advanced notification of planned works have to go into. One of the things the bill does is make the time scales that that information has to go into much shorter so everyone can have it. The information ports over to a public-facing website so absolutely anyway, any bus company, any supermarket, any member of the public has got access to that information when these roads are going to be closed, contact details of who to speak to about diversionary routes, that kind of thing. So by tightening that, it makes it better for everyone, including bus companies. Uh, the other thing is about uh, emergency works and things. Other parts of the bill tighten the commissioner's inspection. Well, it gives him an inspection function. He doesn't have one at the moment. It gives him better powers to investigate these things. So if there is a genuine gas escape or a water leak, that could be notified as emergency if it's perhaps not genuine. There'll be additional powers for the commissioner to be able to investigate that and address it. No, just uh, I know certainly that it's been raised with me that uh, that short notice, uh, certainly for non-emergency uh, works, uh, and and the the confusion that it causes, and uh, the hassle that it causes, uh, not only the operator but certainly uh, bus users, and. Uh, uh, I will keep on, certainly, I'll examine further, you know, obviously what's in the bill and continue the dialogue I have uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, bus operators in my constituency, but I know that the fact that it's still um, being raised uh, by the industry, uh, clearly there are still some uh, some concerns there uh, that it could be tightened a bit further. Um, any roadworks which will take more than 10 days or will involve a road closure need to be notified three months in advance. So that information should be in the public domain for at least, I mean there will be occasions where for coordination purposes that time scale has to be shortened but the norm is, is that that type of information should be in the public domain three months before the works happen. And I mean with the, the website now the way it is, maybe historically that wasn't available but with the public facing website if you, if you know what your bus routes are, you know where you, where's going to affect you, you know where your own house is, what's going to affect your own commute, you can look in this and look and see what's happening. Obviously, if it's something that's planned much shorter, if there's a you know emergency pothole or whatever, you can't have those long timescales. But for planned works, the ones that takes over 10 days or have road closures, it should be there three months in advance. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. Any, yeah, Mr Finlay? Uh, just on the sort of wider points, um, Tomorrow evening in my, my region I've got a public meeting about buses because of the um, uh, withdrawal of a whole swathe of services. Um, what is there in 
what's being proposed that I can tell the people tomorrow night that things will change because bus companies have withdrawn services. The public have had very little say in that and they have no power to change that. What hope can you give to people? So some of the provisions within the bill was, uh, for example, it gives the powers for um, um, LTAs uh, to have bus service improvement partnerships uh, put in place, uh, working with bus service providers, um, which can have, which can look at specific routes. Um, it gives local authorities as well, LTAs, the opportunity to look at having franchises in place. Uh, and it also gives um, uh, gives them the power uh, that where they, in certain circumstances, uh, wish to deliver a bus service themselves, that they can actually then deliver a bus service directly themselves uh, within an area. So it expands the range of options that LTAs have around addressing these types of issues. Um, in some cases, working with operators, uh, but also in certain circumstances, giving uh, uh, local authorities the powers to be able to actually deliver bus services within these areas themselves. And um, with the financial wherewithal to do that? Well, there's always going to be a, a financial limitation to these types of matters. Um, uh, uh, there is, um, there's no additional funding provided for that purpose. Um, it's for local authorities. So, for example, just now in my own local authority area, there are certain routes which they choose to subsidise because they see them as being essential services. Uh, that they work with the bus operators in order to maintain services to some of these uh, communities uh, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be commercially viable. Um, uh, it could be in the future that as a local authority they choose uh, not to provide that subsidy but instead choose to use that resource for the delivery of bus services directly themselves if they choose to do so. Um, they have the option uh, in which to choose to, to, to choose to do that. But this gives them a greater range of options than they have available to them at the present moment. Okay. Any other questions from members? No? Um, can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for your time this morning and your officials, uh, and I'll move the meeting into private session. <laughs>